is very interesting to see how corporate Arcadia, whether it, you know, to what extent it is connected to its environment or not. Uh, and that is what my presentation is uh, really about. It's about uh, can corporate Arcadia can, can it also pave the road towards a sustainable and circular built environment? Because that is uh, how nowadays often uh, corporate social s sustainability or, or uh, responsibility is being framed. And it also has to do with this connection to the environment, both physically, organizationally, and um, um, institutionally. I just took a simple graph of uh, um, sustainability, um, and it consists of these uh, people, planet, and profit dimensions. It's a multi-value concept, embracing these multiple values, and usually the idea is that sustainability includes them all. But of course there are also many trade-offs between these uh, different values and it's not just uh, um, corporates uh, uh, commissioning uh, their uh, buildings um, to architects that they have to uh, um, see, uh, well, they have to make choices between these different values and how to balance them, but it's also the architects themselves uh, that are struggling with these balances. And of course, you can uh, the, the, the struggle of balancing and, and making decisions between these different values is also a struggle that does not take place just at the uh, level of the building, but it also uh, um, you can also uh, frame it at a higher skill level. It also has to do about how to position the building in its uh, urban environment. Um, what you see uh, a bit of history over the time, how corporate, uh, corporate organizations, how they have addressed these uh, different sustainability values. You see that uh, in the uh, start of the 19th century, or 20th century, at the late 19th century, uh, with the uh, industrialization and the, also the noticeable uh, um, effects on health, working conditions and the environment, uh, there was lots of attention uh, um, amongst uh, uh, directors of uh, corporate industry um, to these uh, effects. And um, some uh, were very innovative in that, sen in that sense and that they took, took the responsibility. So, in the, in the, well, more than one century ago, the emphasis was especially on the people dimension and that's uh, um, really special, I think, to see that at, nowadays we're struggling to get people back in again in this sustainability frame, but we started actually from the people. And this is uh, an entrepreneur from Delft, Jacob van Marke, um, and he was one of these uh, first social entrepreneurs uh, in the Netherlands that really decided to take care of his employees. And he constructed the Agneta Park, it's, um, I think it was named after his wife, uh, it's uh, near Delft, if you go on the railway uh, to The Hague, you can have a good look at it. And he constructed there uh, um, some housing and a nice uh, public surrounding for uh, uh, some of his employees. Also, um, he was um, the first company in the Netherlands with a representative council from the employees. Uh, which was, of course, especially in those days, very uh, innovative and it was also challenging because if employees start speaking truth to power, uh, then you never know where it ends up. He set up schools for his employees, uh, made sure that working uh, conditions were uh, um, uh, health and safe. He um, was the first one also to uh, ensure his uh, employees against any uh, labor uh, accidents or accidents that they uh, happened uh, during their work, uh, working hours. Um, and also, uh, um, he was the first one with a fixed phone line in his house, and it was from the uh, Agneta Park, where his house was, to the uh, glue and gelatin factory, uh, which is uh, on the TU Delft campus. Uh, uh, it has been included, sort of, in the campus nowadays. So. Um, yeah, innovative, uh, both on the social uh, side, but also uh, really entrepreneurial and uh, making use of new technologies. Um, if we take a bit of a um, big jump in time, uh, we go um, to the 1960s and 70s uh, when uh, 
there was more environmental awareness of um, um, our processes of uh, industrial production and the mass consumption of our goods and uh, it was the time of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, uh, that our pesticides were damaging the environment. It was the time of the oil crisis as well, that we became aware of the affinity of our resources. It was the time of the Club of Rome and that is where this whole environmental uh, awareness started and when uh, sustainable building, sustainable building and construction uh, got into focus also of um, um, designers and construction companies. And this planet dimension uh, it is especially um, um, uh, established or reflected in all these uh, labeling and certification systems that have been uh, um, embedded also in our um, uh, legal systems, our regulatory frameworks. So lots of these uh, labels, they are set up by industry themselves, so they are fully private. Uh, and it's a sort of uh, negotiated, negotiated uh, knowledge of what sustainability is and uh, what level you can achieve uh, with it. Um, and at the same time, it is also a sort of uh, iconic uh, um, label for uh, uh, corporations. Is there something going on there? Oh! <laughs> I think I said we take a jump in time, but <laughs> it takes it literally. <laughs> um, so lots of um, uh, these iconic buildings, uh, um, when companies want to express their uh, corporate uh, responsibility, uh, their environmental responsibility, they go for this uh, such a label and they want to score really high uh, on these aspects and so they can put a gold plate on their building or a platinum plate and they really can show we're on the top of our league here. Uh, it's all symbolically actually, um, so there's no financial uh, incentive, um, uh, there's no, uh, not much financial gains. Um, it, it is also not so much uh, more expensive, also lots of the measures you can take on a budget neutral basis uh, but it does require some uh, additional knowledge or uh, uh, different ways of operating and, and, uh, and the, the uh, processes of uh, design and construction. So in that sense it does require some innovative attitude of organizations also to achieve uh, the goals embedded in these kind of labeling and certification systems. Um, then um, we take another, and, and I think the, these kind of labeling and certification systems, they are still uh, uh, present and still uh, uh, often also requested by uh, public authorities also when commissioning uh, uh, buildings to be constructed. Uh, also private companies still use them and at the same time if you look at the organizations that uh, run these um, uh, labels and certifications there is a sort of end uh, um, to it uh, that they see okay how much further can we raise the bar and is it still uh, uh, doing uh, its work the way we intend it to be can we still push ambitions further in this uh, by using these labels or should we go to another kind of incentive uh, system for uh, um, architects and developers to, uh, to push for the uh, boundaries of what is uh, environmentally uh, possible. Uh, then we take another, uh, oh yeah, and here is the edge for example, oh, it's not a clear picture. Um, it, it is the, the, the top of the list uh, recent, uh, or a few years ago realized in the Netherlands uh, also. It, it's by a building of Deloitte, uh, the accountancy company, and um, well, it's, it's sort of top of the bill at the moment in the Netherlands. Then we take another uh, leap, um, uh, a small jump in time this time, and it's, uh, oh, it's entirely stopped now. Um, and we go more to the profit dimension because also in um, um, in industry there was this uh, um, 
awareness that uh, by, by pushing for bits by bits in uh, improving the environmental performance of buildings, uh, there were just some incremental improvements, but it doesn't lead to any fundamental changes on a wider system level of the whole sector and the system in which it operates. And uh, the circular economy is a, a, a concept that has gained lots of popularity uh, in recent years. It was launched uh, widely by uh, Ellen MacArthur and her foundation. Uh, it is pushed by a uh, private industry. There is this top 100 of uh, big uh, international companies uh, that are behind uh, this uh, um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They sponsor her and in the development of this <coughs> concept. And the idea of the circular economy that you make environmental uh, um, um, responsible behavior, that you make it pay. So if you can earn money by acting responsibly, then the system will finance itself and everybody will start immediately uh, from a profit-based point of view uh, to act responsibly. And the idea is that you reuse materials on an indefinite basis and that we don't need to uh, use our finite resources anymore. Um, this is the latest of uh, corporate Arcadia in the field of uh, circularity. It's a circle, a pavilion on the south uh, axis in the city of Amsterdam, the business district. Uh, it is connected, it, it was uh, financed by ABN Enro, um, and it is connected to it, it's uh, on its uh, plot. Uh, there's an underground uh, um, hallway to the banking headquarters. Um, it, is, uh, it has been constructed with lots of uh, reused uh, building components, uh, with lots of uh, challenges, both uh, from an uh, architectural uh, and construction point of view. Uh, but also institutionally, because uh, the reuse of such materials uh, are also often not uh, in line with what is uh, regulatory uh, required. But nevertheless, they pulled it off. Uh, it is a very uh, pleasant building to be in. They try to uh, um, have these boundaries, uh, like we heard in previous presentations, uh, they try to address these boundaries of uh, how is it a corporate building or is it a public building? They try to blur them. Um, so you can, if you're in Amsterdam uh, entering uh, or exiting the railway station, you can enter there and you can, uh, there, there's a cafe inside, um, you can uh, reserve uh, meeting rooms, um, there is uh, some uh, flexible workspaces to use and so they're trying to uh, cross these uh, public and private boundaries. Um, so does this uh, way of uh, addressing these um, um, people, planet and profit dimensions um, of sustainability, um, does corporate Arcadia, does it, can it really act as a catalyst to achieve these goals? And what um, I noticed and what I also uh, heard from previous uh, presenters uh, is that the focus on the building level is on the one hand very uh, um, um, functional in the sense that on a building level you can achieve certain ambitions, but uh, we need to extend these ambitions to uh, not just to the wider public space and the surrounding urban environment and all the users and uh, inhabitants in that area, but we should also uh, connect it to the organizations uh, more that uh, occupy the buildings, that uh, connect to the buildings. And I like the, one of the slide in, slides in your presentation that you already showed that also the internal and the interior, how it is decorated and what kind of hand that you also need all these plants to uh, um, have a, a healthy uh, uh, indoor air quality and working environment. Um, that is already a nice way to connect the building uh, also to people working in the organization. But I also asked, for example, the accountants from Deloitte, um, well, if you work in such a responsible building, what does it do you for your organizational goals? How do you uh, uh, take it along in advising your clients? 
Uh, how do you take it along in uh, changing your procedures uh, on the, your internal accountability? Um, so the connection with the uh, organizations, uh, the corporate organizations inhabiting uh, and using uh, corporate Arcadia, I think the relationship uh, between the internal organization and the building they occupy uh, could be much more uh, explored and possibly used. Um, so the catalyst functions of uh, corporate buildings uh, could be much bigger in that sense. Um, and also the, uh, the connection with the wider institutional environment. So how does this building also not only, uh, ha how is it uh, positioned within the environment, within the urban environment uh, in which it takes up function, but also how is it embedded within the institutional environment and what kind of market conditions are needed to really make it uh, work and pay in the way it is perceived by these concepts of circularity. And that brings me to my final slide. Um, and it was a question that I had also, because if you look at these corporate buildings and these iconic buildings, you might, uh, you really see that they uh, um, um, are really um, isolated uh, projects uh, in their environment. And at the moment, if you look at a more urban level, that you see that it's especially um, public Arcadia, perhaps, that is, uh, or, or the, the citizens Arcadia, that is pushing for um, uh, sustainability on a wider area level. And this is a picture of the Heuvel, it's on the north bank of uh, Amsterdam, in the shadow of the Eye Museum uh, that you showed. Um, and this is a, a, an example of temporary use uh, initiated uh, by a group of uh, dedicated uh, citizens and civic organizations um, to use this plot and by having a very uh, responsible uh, environmentally sound uh, temporary usage of this plot, they really inspire the uh, existing and future um, uh, owners and residents of this uh, whole industrial plot um, to redevelop uh, the plot in a more uh, circular and environmentally responsible way. And uh, this sort of push from the bottom for this more inclusive and sustainable, sustainable kind of development of this area um, well, has been much more prominent in this, um, in this particular uh, uh, project than, for example, the Eye Museum, which is uh, positioned at the corner of this, uh, of this plot.